Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Well, I'm, I've got an impossible mission now. It's four o'clock in the afternoon, Cuenca, it's very hot. And your stomachs are full, I guess, because I hope you have eaten and drunk a lot. So my impossible mission is to prevent you from falling asleep. <laughs> so I hope you help me accomplish this goal. Well, first of all, um, we're going to start by doing a, a, a very short meditation. Because in our previous session, Christina managed to create a wonderful atmosphere, a magical atmosphere. And I don't want to break that feeling with which you left this room. So before I start talking about design thinking and creativity and Cleo, I need you to be in the right mood. I need you to be receptive to what design thinking entails, right? So as you probably know by now, uh, mindfulness brings lots of benefits for your bodies and for your minds. And one of them is the simple fact that it encourages, it fosters creativity. So I'm going to sort of resume the talk at the point where Christina stopped her presentation, right? So now that you know that mindfulness means to be present here and now, uh, to be, not just to live or to exist, just to be in the present moment, now you are ready to start making sense of what design thinking is. So I'm going to stop at this point. We're going to listen to Christina. It's going to be a, a very short meditation, but I want you to be present. Actually, I need you to be present to, to, get, the point of, to get the point of design thinking, right? Okay. Welcome back. I will start the meditation, so I'm going to ask you kindly to put your feet on the wooden floor and to sit on the verge of your chairs. If you want, if not, it's okay. Gently closing your eyes. Leaving behind all those sensations of heat, all those sensations of being surrounded by noise, all those sensations by being surrounded by people having lunch. We are no longer having lunch. We are already here. And we are feeling our feet reconnecting with the earth. We are reconnecting with our heart beating Are you breathing? Are you still breathing? Do you feel your breathing? Is your mind going away? That's okay. No problem. If you realize that your mind is going away, you kindly take it back to your breath. 
and your breath is still here with you. It is coming in, it is coming out, and you are here being yourself, reconnecting, re-engaging. Inhale. Exhale. Feel your body breathing in. Feel your body breathing out. Are you mindful now? Is your body here? Is your mind here? Are your emotions here? Welcome to the present moment. A present moment which discloses before your eyes and offers new opportunities for what is happening and gives you the opportunity one more time to be here, to take in the present, whatever it has to offer. Reconnecting, rooting, rooting within yourselves. As we come to the end of this short meditation, take a deep breath and let's take this deep breath together in the hope that what is about to come will re-engage within yourselves. Inhale, exhale. Welcome to the present moment. Thank you very much, Christina, for another wonderful guided meditation. So now you are mindful, you're ready to learn a little bit about design thinking. Does everybody know what design thinking is? Are you familiar with this new concept? Does anybody know? This is the microphone. Okay, does anybody know what design thinking is? Have you heard about this before? Those of you who have heard about this concept, can you please raise your hands? So nobody. Okay, so it's a huge challenge for me to try and introduce a new concept for you. It's an emerging concept, even though it, it was born at some point in the early 1970s at the University of Stanford, California. It was only in 2008 uh, that a man by the name Tim Brown started to start talking about design thinking. Well, I have divided my presentation into three, uh, four different blocks. The first part is, I'm afraid, uh, a bit theoretical, so I'm going to be sitting down so that you can hear my voice well. In the first part, I'm going to introduce the basics of design thinking. I'll tell you about the five different stages or phases that make up design thinking. In the second part, I'd like you to think about the pedagogical potential uh, that design thinking can bring into your own classroom practice. 
The third part is going to be more about the connections between design thinking and CLIO. Uh, there isn't much research about this yet. I mean, if you Google CLIO design thinking, all you will find out is going to be a, a, a link to this course, to this summer course. So for those of you who are interested in research, this is an emerging field of research. And the fourth part is going to be largely practical. I want the approach to be experiential. So I'm going to give you the basics, the theoretical underpinnings, but then I want you to experience design thinking firsthand, right? And at the end, I will try to wrap up my presentation with some conclusions. So I hope you don't find this too boring, right? This is not mindfulness, but it's closely connected to mindfulness somehow, as you will see. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning and let's get serious. Just have a look at these two comic strips. Both strips represent what I call a teacher's dream which is pupils' autonomy and happiness. I think you will agree with me on the simple fact that we as teachers want our students to be autonomous, independent, and happy. Do you agree with me? So look at the first strip, the first comic strip. What do you mean I'm not independent enough? Show me how to be independent. I can be independent without your help. That's meant to be ironical. You, I can't see you laughing, but this is really ironical as you can see. What's the best way to teach your students to start being independent? You have to give them freedom. You have to give them opportunities to know what it means to make mistakes, to find their own way around, to navigate learning on their own. And this is closely connected to more design thinking means, as we'll see in a few minutes. Look at the second strip. All I want is for you to be happy. Oh, that is so sweet. You're much less of a pain in the ass when you're happy. Well, this ties up very well with uh, Jose Luis's talk this morning about mixed ability and attention to diversity. I'm sure that you as teachers want all your students to be engaged in the learning experiences and the activities and tasks and projects and everything that you design for your wonderful lessons. You want that to be engaged. You want your students to take part and to feel that they fit in. That's why it's so important to create um, an emotionally safe and supportive atmosphere in class. And you can get this by means of memorable learning experiences. And design, design thinking, in my opinion, can give us tools and resources to give our students memorable experiences. Now, I'm going to be repeating this concept over and over again throughout my presentation. A memorable learning experience is one that leaves an imprint on your students' minds and hearts, an experience that they are going to remember for the rest of their lives. And what is even more important, a memorable learning experience is one that brings about deep learning. And deep learning means that your students are really acquiring content in a clear setting and that they are learning the language that they need to talk about and write about disciplinary content. I'm taking for granted that you all know what CLIL is. Are you familiar with the four C's framework? You know that. Are you familiar with HOTS and LOTS and Bloom's taxonomy? Well, to me, the most important singularity of CLIO lies precisely in this, that you, as content teachers, have got a tremendous challenge in your hands, which is teaching the content of curricular subjects by means of a language which is not your mother tongue, which is not your student's mother tongue. So you have to bear in mind that you have to make sure somehow that you are teaching the content but also the language that your students need to access that content. So disciplinary knowledge and disciplinary discourse, the language that your students need to articulate their understanding. Right? Are you with me? That's a challenge, very difficult. If I were in your position, I wouldn't know what, where to start, really. Well, I like this comic strip very much, and, uh, and about to finish my introduction. 
This is what I call creativity or the weight of the human soul. This is a, a, a strip from The Guardian, which was published a few years ago. Can you read the text? Well, it says, well, it's the title is The Math Test. Miss, and trying to work out how many frogs hatch out if 73% are eaten by birds. But I think I have accidentally calculated the weight of the human soul. Oh, for Pete's sake, let me have a look. Good heavens, so you have. But I'm afraid I can't give you any marks as it isn't the right answer. That evening at home, I am very disappointed. You fail maths again. Doesn't calculating the weight of the human soul count for anything? Frankly, no. In the current political and economic climate, knowing how much your soul weighs won't help you get a job. Now, this may seem uh, like exaggeration to you, but this is what happens many times in our classrooms. Uh, according to Ken Robinson, school systems all over the world seem to be killing kids' imagination and creativity. Do you think schools kill creativity? They do, well, to a certain extent. Let's not be extremely pessimistic. But to me, this comic strip makes me rethink what I do in my own lessons as a teacher. If school is killing creativity, I should do something about the way I teach. And it's my responsibility. It is a social imperative. We can't expect anyone else to come into our classroom and do the job for ourselves, right? So creativity should be one of the goals of any education systems on earth. Or the same applies to mindfulness. Just, you, you have probably already realized, you, you have probably come to the realization that mindfulness creates the, the necessary predisposition for students to absorb knowledge and to start creating something new. Well, design thinking, as we shall see in a few minutes, is more concerned about cultivating hearts than lots. Hots are higher order thinking skills. Now think about the top of the pyramid, create. Design thinking is about giving people tools to create something new. And this takes me to the next slide. We live in the so-called knowledge society. I don't have to come all the way from Cordoba to tell you this, but this has got deep, profound implications for what we do in education. I personally believe in the power of intelligence, creativity and solidarity in the effort that people can make together to change the world for the better, not for the worse, because it's pretty bad as it stands that right now. So in, in the knowledge age, at a time of unprecedented historical changes, at a time when you have instantaneous access to lots of data and information on the internet or on any electronic device on the palm of your hand, smartphones, for instance, the school has to go a step further and teach students skills that they are going to need to solve lots of problems in a world that is getting more and more complicated. I don't know whether you have heard about the so-called wicked problems. Wicked problems are international terrorism, climate change, poverty, disease, lots of problems regarding immigration, the refugees crisis, those are wicked problems. And they can't be solved by just one person, but just one nation. We need huge doses of collective intelligence and solidarity to cope with these problems. And at that point, I think design thinking can contribute something relevant. Okay, so let's start talking about design thinking more in, in, in depth. What are the origins of the concept? What are the stages, the phases of design thinking? Uh, what lessons can we, can we learn from designers? Well, design thinking is, is not new, as I said before. Um, actually, I would say that design thinking is as old as humanity. Because um, human beings throughout time, throughout history, have had to cope with lots of problems. The invention of fire 
the invention of the will, those are early examples of design thinking. Design thinking, put simply, is finding a solution to a problem that you have in front of you. That's it. That's the simplest definition I can give you of design thinking. And if that's the simplest definition I can give you of design thinking, that means that design thinking can be used in a wide array of contexts, including education, including bilingual education, including CLIL. So whatever there is, a, there's a problem, there's a, there is room for collective solidarity, for collective intelligence, there is an opportunity to find a solution to a problem. And well, you know that working in a bilingual context is not easy. There are lots of problems that you need to tackle, that you need to face every day. And the important thing is to find a solution to those problems. Now, the important thing, again, is to do it as part of a team and not individually, right? So design thinking comes from product designers, from the world of product designers. And by product designers, I mean people who design such things as smartphones or a chair or a light bulb, anything. I mean, any technological piece of equipment is the product of human creativity, right? But design thinking has evolved over time. So it's not just a matter of having a solitary genius in a laboratory or in a room finding the perfect solution to a problem. It's much more often the case that you have uh, interdisciplinary groups of people, teams of people who've got expertise in different fields. They, and they bring together a huge amount of talent and they come up with a solution to a problem. So that's the origin of design thinking. Product designers. Steve Jobs, for example, is a product designer. A very successful, by the way. We're going to have a look at the five phases of design thinking. Very simple. They are empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And we're going to look at each of them in detail. And the most interesting thing about design thinking is precisely that it sort of brings about a new mindset that fosters cooperation and creativity in a classroom, at school, as a space where we have to solve problems, lots of problems, because cooperation is the stuff of growth. 